Thanks, Stefan. Thank you for coming down to the It's really appreciated by everyone here. Uh, but my question is for you, Lauren. Uh, do you still identify as a man? If so, can, can I have your number? If not, well, I'm not really interested. <laughs> And it has actually caused a lot of problems in my dating life, much like the articles that say I have drowned refugees. But <laughs> just as long as people's parents don't Google me, dates usually go pretty okay. <laughs> hey, I'm not a man in Australia, so oh, I'm not gay. I'm like, oh, you're an Apache, so you're going to be very skilled. It's mainly for Lauren, but happy for Stefan to answer it. Um, it's about the role of women in the right wing, because I'm sure, as you would know, you get a lot of criticism from the right as well. Your 4chan mainly calls you, you know, a Jewish coal burner, and you do and you do it for the attention, and the male first, like every other woman out there. So my question is, like, um, do you think that women do have a role to play in right-wing activism? And do you think that it should be for specific groups of people? Or whether anybody who's hard is in the right place should do what you guys do? First of all, there are easier ways to get attention. <laughs> I certainly could go on Twitch and do that all day, right? <laughs> it would be a lot easier to do that than have uh, crazy screeching ladies trying to tap me on a stage. Um, <laughs> But th there is a role, and I do agree though that there are going to be women that will be outliers from the norm. Women bring something to all conversations. They bring a, although I may be a little different in some cases, but they bring a bit of femininity. That's something that feminists have really forgotten to praise, that there is a kind of softer side. There's a human side of conversations that need to happen. When, when we are facing extreme threats to our civilization, men are going to be the ones that will say, all right, we are going to cut the conversation. It's just going to be serious facts, not consider the human side. And women will consider the human side. And that does need, that is so important to children's development. That is so important to making sure a society functions properly. So you have to have both. You have, men and women both have roles to play in all of our society, and in our political debates as well. contribute to that? No. No, I would just say, I think we've got to be careful of, I, I, to me, the term right-wing activism, the left has done a pretty good job of owning the term right-wing, you know, like far-right, alt-right, extreme right-wing, you know, because Nazi is apparently just tough to type. So, you know, I would just say, Focusing on the truth, focusing on facts, reason and evidence, philosophically speaking, and so on. The moment they can categorize you, you're kind of half lost because you got to kind of climb out of that hole. So that would be my suggestion. Just about the terminology as a whole. So that's the only one I had. The thing I wanted to add to that. Please begin the aid. Um, I'm a more eloquent reader than speaker. Um, so there are fairly significant gaps between men and women in propensity towards free market ideal, ideals and intelligence. Sorry, I mentioned the messenger. The gap, this gap creates a situation whereby there is perhaps only one smart young woman for every four smart young men. This being the case, we would expect that these few women would go for the tall, wealthy, famous, virtuous men such as yourself. Um, given that there are simply not enough women to go around with these ideals, what advice would you give to men, such as my friend? Oh, I'm asking that. I think that you should enjoy the competition because that means when you win, it's even sweeter. Um, I would also say to that that uh, women, like, not always, there are outliers. I have to specify this because the media here, I made a comment that. Uh, women on average don't really like being CEOs, and next thing you know, news.au is publishing, Lauren says women are not psychologically prepared to be in any leadership positions. I was like, oh, okay, that's great, so I have to be careful what I say here. But um, a lot of women, they aren't so interested in politics. It's not what we are interested in our whole. If you look at the statistics for YouTube, it's like 80% of people watching political videos tend to be men. So if you are looking for a woman that is interested in your ideas or isn't going to be a crazy leftist, look for someone who, at the very least, even if they are leftists, is just
just open to considering different ideas, is open to having a debate, because if you propose better arguments, guaranteed, she's probably just never heard them before because she's been inundated with mainstream media, and you have an opportunity to change that mind. Well, then don't hide your values. Like, dating is all about efficiency, so don't like hide and say, well, you know, I guess I read something about Trump on somewhere, or, you know, I'm just like, I'm, I think, do you think? Maybe we can think together, and, and if they run, good, that's efficient, right? So it's just about the slowing mechanism, right? Be yourself, everyone else is taken, just go and find someone by being blatantly yourself, uh, right up front, and if they like it, you're solid, if they don't, you've just saved yourself 20 bucks on a day. <laughs> So because we started a little bit late, we're going to let the Q&A go till 10.45, and, uh, sorry, 9, no, 10.45, that was right, yeah, and, um, and then we'll be able to buy books and get them signed by the authors um, out there. Hi, I'd like to firstly thank the venue owner, because this is the venue that came to the restaurant of the world just a few years ago. that he came to our rescue too. We signed the contract yesterday morning. So he's, uh, he's in Iraqi. He's an Iraqi who doesn't want Australian culture to become the culture he left behind. single thing in your mind which is the end of words and the start of swords in terms of government oppression or changes of culture? At what point do you say, no, that's it, done talking, it's over, you're gone? Well, I mean, uh, as long as we have the capacity for free speech, free speech is what we use. I mean, arguments is civilization, right? There's the old saying that the first person to throw an insult rather than a rock was the founder of civilization. And so as long as we have the capacity to reason with each other, to present arguments, to present challenging facts and information, that's what we should do. And when free speech goes away, I don't even know like what happens then, but it obviously isn't gonna be free speech. something practical that Australians can do to change the doctrine of that multiculturalism that we're talking about. What's your thoughts? Uh, well, I believe that talking about ethnic differences in intelligence is probably a good place to start. You know, it's funny. Um, everybody loves diversity except, say, human biodiversity. <laughs> Suddenly their diversity is not a strength. That is an important question, because if they can convince you that everyone is the same, then if you say, well, maybe we'll have this and not this, then it just looks like prejudice, right? But if you have some sort of reasoned arguments behind as to why you may want to change immigration policies, well, you have a reasoned case, and you can, you know, people will get mad at you and so on, but uh, if it's just sort of a vague, vague feeling of ingrained preference and just, you know, easy to portray you as bigoted, so, you know, just challenge people who are science deniers and say, look, these are the facts of human biodiversity as far as they're known. We need to have discussions about this, and from there you can start building something sensible to keep what you have. But uh, it, it's, all, it, it's the one topic that drives the, nut, the, the left completely nuts. So, guess what you have to talk about? <laughs> you know, they, they, they've told you exactly, don't go here, whatever you do, and it's like, okay, so that's where you have to go, I guess. <laughs> I do want to mention here, with the convincing people of why we shouldn't embrace multiculturalism, I, I, it wasn't that big of a topic for me until I actually went to areas like the suburbs of Paris. It wasn't that big of a deal to me until I went to Molenbeek, until I went to Markslow and these no-go zones in Germany. If I could buy a ticket for every journalist to go to South Africa to see what was on the ground there, I would. If I could buy a ticket for everyone that was voting on multicultural policy to see what was going on in suburbs of Paris, I would. The best thing we can do is promote alternative media that's trying to tell these stories, that's trying to tell the truth, take pictures, show videos, and yeah, open up the conversation.
open up the conversation and present the facts. Hi, uh, this is a question for Stefan. Um, how do you rebut the big government or statist argument that living in a state such as Australia is a voluntary contractual agreement through citizenship? As it could be argued that you're free to leave the country at any time. Uh, you might reply that uh, you were born into citizenship is not something you agreed to. Uh, it's not a choice you made. Wouldn't that imply that uh, it is only moral to, to raise a child in a purely anarcho society? Okay, so as far as the social contract goes, so philosophically speaking, if you give one ability to a human being, the universal argument is it has to apply to everyone. So there are people in the government who say, we have the right to impose these rules upon you, but the government is not some magic other dimensional place where people have opposite properties or rights. So philosophically speaking, if person A has the right to impose a unilateral, uninvited contract on person B, hey, guess what, turn out is fair play. Person B then has the right to impose that same, same contract back. Right, so they say, well, you owe us $10,000 in taxes. It's like, oh, we get to just impose taxes on each other? When you owe me $10,000 in taxes, it all cancels out. So you can't sustain, philosophically, logically, you can't sustain the social contract in any way. Specifically, uh, in the lead up to your discussion about Aboriginal culture and history, you said that, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, trying to remember on the spot in front of a couple hundred people, but um, that people tend to say, oh, I know this, and your general argument was they're going to lead you off a cliff and pick your pockets when they're not explaining how they know this, so I, hopefully I'm not rambling, would um, like if you could for you to explain how you came to this knowledge of Aboriginal history. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So we've got uh, sources and we can put these up uh, on, on, on our website. And this is, I assume, going to be a presentation. We'll put sources below. Some primary sources, some secondary sources. You know, the big debate of the, you know, the, the, the black armbands and the white blindfold and so on. This debate has been going on since 1968. Uh, went through a lot of that sort of stuff and government sources for data and so on. So I know that's not much of an answer, but uh, I certainly am very happy to provide the sources and that's a very, very good question. I'm glad you heard that part because, you know, don't, don't take anything I said on faith. Of course, that's the whole point. I seem to be far more popular than the people wanting to tackle me. <laughs> <laughs> um, what advice, Stefan, would you give to a born again libertarian who just happens to be a teacher in our government school? Don't judge me. Um, I'm sorry, I just judged you. I was judging you. Could you go ahead? <laughs> um, who feels like he's standing alone in this, this tsunami of social justice. Um, should I try and subvert the system somehow from within, or should I just give up and seek another profession? Okay, so the, 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 this is a very big question which we all have to deal with, because you, you, you can't change the world by stepping outside the machinery that runs it, right? So I pay my taxes and I show my passport, you know, things that, you know, in an ideal world would probably be quite different. So the question is, can you act with a, a, a sort of world-changing or life-changing amount of integrity in the environment that you're in, right? So I can pay my taxes and I can make my arguments. And if I don't pay my taxes, I go to jail and I can't make my arguments, right? So if the curriculum is so constrained that you have to mouth things that it's like the weasel threw up in your mouth and you're just kind of coughing it on the kids, then that's probably not a great environment. If you have the flexibility to be able to teach stuff that matters to you and is true for the kids and is motivating for the kids within the confines of the curriculum, great. But remember, there's so many alternatives to teaching kids in, 
in a classroom, right? I mean, there, there is, you can homeschooling curricula, you can go on the internet, you can write books, you can, so many things, you can write a novel and, and put great libertarian messages in There's so many different ways that you can do it. We finally do have this technology without gatekeepers, so just keep yourself open and flexible to the best way that you can apply your talents, and thank you so much for thinking along those lines, because so many people don't. Daddy, oh sorry, Stefan, <laughs> you, uh, you might commiserate with the fact that as a gay man I'm told to respect those who came before me, people who fought in Stonewall or whatever, who say you must educate yourself and therefore Lauren, as an attack helicopter, <laughs> what's your sexual orientation? It gets very complicated. No, no, no. I've lost nights of sleep on this. Please, educate me as a gay man who must learn from those who have brought, who have broken the ground before me. No, seriously. Those who come before me and take senses like you do. Well, there are certain kinds of tanks and submarines that have <laughs> conversations with here and there. The Tinder phrase is quite a wild moment. <laughs> but, uh, no, seriously, the whole attack helicopter thing, all of that was, that was such a fun age, the beginning of all this social justice stuff, being able to tell people I'm legally a man and have them screech, it seems like things have gotten a little more dark since then. They're actually pushing over buses. We could actually have a remote conversation with the left, but when we started using their tactics against them, when we started identifying as attack helicopters, once we started showing how ridiculous their arguments were, they just went straight to violence. And unfortunately, it's like, we can't have that same fun anymore with it. In these communities, we can, but they're, they're not engaging with us. I, I, I look forward, or I lament those days where I could just call. Uh... It, it was all fun and games to be started. Yeah. It, it was all fun and games to be started becoming effective. No. Yes, exactly. <laughs> a little less fun, but more exciting. Thank you, though. I'd just like to say, what I'd like to think is that in a space like this, we can still have fun about that. With people who aren't throwing rocks, oh, yes, we can. attack helicopter. <laughs> Uh, my question is mostly for Stefan Molyneux. Um, during the Obama presidency, I believe you and many other libertarians who warned about um, a debt crisis in America, like the, the, the you know, decades of like uh, you know, unfunded liabilities and growing debt. Um, do you believe there will be an economic collapse under Donald Trump? And if it does happen, how would we avoid the perception that like Donald Trump is responsible for it, when in reality it would it's mostly as a result of Obama's policies, but even before Obama, it's something's been building since like the Reagan years. Yeah, that's my question. Well, yeah, I mean, so if, if they fail at this whole Russian collusion fable, then it seems quite likely that central banks and so on will probably try to tri trigger some kind of crash so that they can blame Donald Trump and, and try and change the political leadership back towards this crazy stuff that was going on under Obama. So, uh, it, it, mathematically, that which cannot continue will not continue. And the current trajectory of all Western countries towards unfathomable, unsustainable levels of debt History shows repeatedly, ancient Rome, uh, revolutionary France, Weimar Republic of Germany, it happens every single time. So don't be fooled by the calm before the storm, you know, make your preparations, as I say, prepare yourself accordingly, and I've got a bunch of videos on that. But um, yeah, of course, every time something goes wrong, they blame the free market, and every time the free market survives, they praise the government. That's just the way that these lunatics work, and we just have to keep getting the message out there, so that when a crisis does hit, we identify the proper culprit, which is, Force the governments, the coercion, that is the problem. Yeah, um, would you agree, as much as I love Donald Trump for his anti-political correctness, I would actually I would actually prefer something like Ron Paul Ron Paul's economic policies. Would you agree with that? 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Donald Trump is a populist, which means that he's half a leader and half a follower. And there's pluses and minuses to all of that. The, the, the follow part got him into the White House. The, the, the leader part buys us maybe half a generation to, to fix things or, or find another solution. But uh, Ron Paul, I mean, his critique of Federal Reserve, his critique of central banking, his critique of government control of interest rates is all flawless and fantastic, but I don't think he'd get very far, you know, in American politics because very few people understand that stuff. We've got about 20 minutes left. I dare say there's no point joining the queue if you're not already in it. Hopefully we can get through those who are, so... Yeah, hey. Um, my question is for Stefan. Um, you talked a lot about the truth in your talk, but also the virtue of data science. Um, there are a lot of fools, there were a lot of fools outside, but for years it could be said that there have been similar puritanism patterns in the scientific community with kind of your, um, within the skeptic community and like libertarian reductionist types. Uh, key, some key members in the Dawkins Foundation have been known examples. So, my question would be, when you have an educa educated field like that and they kind of sit upon, sit upon an ivory tower that seems unassailable, um, how do we keep the virtues of science and progress alive when the, the foundations itself are being attacked by a form of corruption within that don't allow for that kind of progress? You know, like Dean Ray and Rupert Sheldrake have effectively lost a lot of their career because they approached ten subjects and they just get isolated and removed. So how would we deal with that? And to Lauren quickly, um, would that be something that journalists like you would cover in the future? Thanks. So, so science needs to be returned to serving the people. Because right now, science is serving the government. Because the government is paying the bills for science, and there's huge amounts of funding available for governments who tow, as a scientist who tow the government line. Science needs to be returned to serving the people, to serving what benefits the people. Not what benefits the bureaucrats, what benefits politically correct uh, obfuscation and, and pursuit of inconsequentiality. And the only way to do that is to take government funding out of science so that, I mean, I answer to the people, which is why as a philosopher I come and talk and, and, and do call in shows and I try to bring philosophy to the service of the people. And if you've not experienced that as a government scientist, it's really hard to even know what that means. So science has got this weird ivory tower because it's been disconnected from market forces from having to serve the people people who are actually forced to fund it. So returning the science to the market will turn scientists into the beneficiaries of humanity and genuine pursuers of truth rather than propagandists, which they so often are at the moment. Yes, as we cover that in the future, there are a ton of topics that I would love to cover, that I would love to do. Um, but right now, uh, most of my focus is on this these behemoths of questions of identity, because I think that is where the real civil wars are going to come. This is where the bloodshed is going to come from. This is where I hope we can avoid the pile of bodies if we address these questions now. So a lot of my efforts are going to these questions of identity, but that would be something that I would still love to look into later. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, this is you, Lauren. Um, I'll, when I'm watching the documentary on Farmlands, a lot of people were pretty terrified to you know, speak openly and honestly. But they, even then they had to put their faces out there. I was wondering, do you keep in touch with any of those? And uh, do you know if they face any consequences for speaking out in your documentary? Um, yeah, I do keep in touch with a lot of the people uh, from South Africa. One, one of the points in the documentary, there's a group chat that goes up with the, the four farm watch. And it shows some videos and some audio clips. and. It honestly, I, it, it pains me to open up that group chat sometimes because you can only take so much, you can only read so much, and it, it, the fact that it pains me, I am so far removed. I am gone from South Africa. I got to leave that country, and I, yeah, I can barely open up some of the group chats that they're in because every single day there's a picture of one of the farmers in the chat with his hand all mangled up. Someone's died. I've never gotten a worse message than I did on Father's Day. Um, that morning I got a message from the farmers and they said there had been five attacks that night and that they would love to spend time with their families and it would be lovely to just calm down that they were very vulnerable that day because the attackers knew they would be 
they would be laying low, they wouldn't be with the weapons, they wouldn't be alert, they would be spending time with their families. So that message said, we've, had, we've lost a lot of people this week, but everyone stay vigilant today. And it, oh, it's just heartbreaking. Yes, I'm still in contact with people there, and I, I just hope that people understand that Farmlands is not just a movie, it's not just a video on a screen. These are real people, and they're still suffering through this every day, it's getting worse. Hi, uh, great to see you both in person. Uh, I just got a question probably to both of you, but uh, Stefan, you spoke about Aboriginal culture and the children which were killed by tribesmen. Now, that created a decline, I suppose, in the population. I couldn't sort of help thinking of parallels uh, with European decline in population and abortion. Now, I'm not coming from any religious perspective. I'm curious. So what's your view on abortion and demographics in general? decline in European population. <laughs> well, um, nice, nice and easy one. Um, <laughs> I think the answer is 42. Is that <laughs> in the realm of anyone? So, uh, abortion, I think, is, is horrifying and horrible, and it is the destruction of a life. I'm not a big fan of government solutions because it's a violation of the non-aggression principle and stuff I've talked about before. Uh, the, the solution, if there's no welfare state, then people have to be more careful who they have sex with. If people are in monogamous, committed relationship when they have unprotected sex, then the baby has the best chance to grow up in a healthy environment. And if uh, a woman gets pregnant outside of wedlock and doesn't want to raise the child, then she should be able to be paid for giving birth to the baby to couples who want children. That way you get to keep a life and satisfy the woman's desire to not have the baby and satisfy another couple's desire to raise a baby. And uh, the fact that the government blocks all of this uh, is kind of sinister, I think. Hi, uh, my question is primarily for Lauren, but I would love for us to, uh, to weigh in on this as well. Um, Lauren, I heard you the debate that you gave at the Anarchist Convention about the oh, uh, borders. Yeah. Um, there was an absence of an argument that was the most obvious to me, which made me think that there's something wrong with it. So, and it's about if a, like a family or even a small community can have land, own a property, defend their own borders, well, why can't a country? Right, and that was one of the greatest problems of Larkin's proposition is he didn't realize that a lot of our nations had formed by people making social contracts to have a unique identity and values that should be protected by a border. And it was, we are tax-paying citizens. We are paying for the space. So it, it, we do have a say in who does come in and doesn't come in, especially when the people coming in are not paying taxes for the most part. They are taking away from us. They are stealing from us to an extent. So it's like a collective plot, and yes, of course, I think if, if I put it down maybe into a smaller argument of a family protecting their property, you would understand, but uh, for some reason this individual, the anarchist I was debating with, couldn't put that on a larger scale. And it was just moral grandstanding, it was purity spiraling, and that's been one of the greatest problems with the libertarian community, is the inability to reach out and meet people where they are, meet the world where it is, and actually propose legitimate solutions for the crises we face in the world. And they purity spiral and have the book clubs. And it's actually heartbreaking because I love Ayn Rand. I love libertarian ideology. I ran for the Libertarian Party when I was in university. And to see that those ideas just go into the ditch of purity spiraling uh, has been a heartbreaking experience. And I found myself on a stage in Mexico arguing against all the principles I used to love because of that. But uh, unfortunately, we have to face things realistically these days. That doesn't mean I don't love those values, that doesn't mean I don't think libertarianism is a beautiful and a perfect world, but you got to have everyone believing in libertarianism to have a perfect libertarian society. Thank you for your question. Hi guys, um, I'm from South Africa. I'd like to say thank you to both of you for speaking out about the final order. violently shot on the head. I'm so sorry. That's reality. My question is for you, Stefan. Um, you've mentioned that we can't feel uh, 
point, you say you can't feel responsible for the actions of the people who came before us uh, in terms of history. But then you also said that people should feel an acknowledgement, almost you spoke of uh, a sense of pride in terms of what we've done. I don't see how the two work together because if you can't feel a sense of guilt, you should also not be able to feel a sense of pride for the people who came before you. Okay, now that's, that's a great point, and I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't clearer about that. So let's, let's say you have a grandfather who painted wonderful paintings, beautiful paintings. Does that mean you're a great painter? No. But seeing that ability may inspire you to become a, a great painter. So having admiration for what came before is different from having passive pride in the achievements of others. If it inspires you, to go to art school, to, to learn how to paint, to create and add beauty to the world, then it's a good thing. But if you're told, well, he was a good painter, or he was a great painter, but he was a terrible human being, and he did this, and he did that, and he was, then you may turn away from all of that, and you've lost something very important that can inspire you. So, I can't take pride in something that I didn't earn or achieve myself, but I can be inspired by that achievement to add to the beauty of the world, and that's what I was trying to get at, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I've got three things to say, so basically, the first question would be directed to Lauren, the second question one with you, but first is a statement which would be, thank you so much to Blair and all the boys who have facilitated helping the security guards here, but mainly, the right wing, all of you, everybody here, because that's what makes it so good. All these people come together to air each other's views, but hear you guys, but especially keep the dream alive. So thank you to all the patriots in this room. Aussie Pride! First question to Lauren, and then second to Stephen. Lauren, as you're probably aware, in Australia we have an issue with our government. They're a bit, let's just say, fucked in the head. <laughs> like many. <laughs> and I swear. But they are a little bit, how you going? What I'm saying is, we've got, what's going on in Australia, you're probably a little bit aware, is we're giving foreign aid to countries like Indonesia. 400 million. But we can't even pay but put diesel in trucks that are convoying hay to northern New South Wales and Queensland. <laughs> Why the hell can't we facilitate helping our own? The government won't even give us cheaper diesel or even just a tax write off for the truck drivers who are donating their trucks, their time, and away from their families to try and help others. There's farmers that are out there giving their own hay, donating from these trucks. People I know personally have been on these combos. Brendan Farrell should be Australian of the Year. He's been going out there. 13 hay runs, helping farmers for 10 years. But the government won't give out $1 or even an excise on diesel taxes to help out, to facilitate helping our own. But they will give $400 million to foreign aid? To, for what? A country that hates us? I, I would really like to know the, your, your personal insight on what we could do to change the way of our government. It's, it's infuriating. It is an absolute betrayal of the people by our governments. It's happening in every Western country right now. And what it is, is it's this bizarre belief that it is somehow more moral or a better thing to do to help someone outside your own community. It's like a Arabian rights thing. And that's what's so infuriating. I, I helped the Syrian refugees. Why did you help the man that's homeless right on your doorstep? Why didn't you help those who are poor in your neighborhood? Why? Because that doesn't make for great Instagram photos. That doesn't make for great bragging rights in politics and government. It's all a game to them. And that's what's so infuriating is these are people's lives. These are your community. This is your country. This is your nation. And you are giving it up. And you are giving up their money for bragging rights, for political games. And oh, it's infuriating. And the amount of foreign aid that we're giving away to other countries, that is taxpayers' money. And I truly believe, if taxpayers were more informed, if the public were more informed about how much is being given away for no reason, I mean, there was millions of dollars given away to fight, this is by the Canadian government, to fight climate change in Africa? Like, they, they, they aren't contributing that much to the, it, it just makes no sense. 
So the, the way we can fight this is, once again, I have to say, through alternative media, through speaking up and showing how the people are being betrayed, showing how much poverty is still in your own nation, showing how many people still need to be helped. Hopefully, hopefully people can go to the polls and vote for their own rights as they did in America. That's what I said in my speech. There is a possibility to change it, and it's going to be through free speech. It's going to be through opening inquiry. Um, and the other thing I mentioned too, put a pushback against this idea that the first world is rich because it stole from the third world. You know, that there's only so much money and if I have two bucks and you have one buck, I must have stolen that buck from you. Because if there is this general idea that the third world is poor because the first world stole from it, then you could make the moral case that you have to give them foreign aid to give the money back. It was stolen, like you steal someone's car, you've got to give it back. Uh, this idea that there's a fixed amount of wealth in the world and some, it just goes against history, it goes against the reality. If I write a song, I haven't stolen from someone, the world's just up one song. And I don't owe royalties to everyone who failed to write a good song, it's just ridiculous. I do. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, want to say I also want to add that with this savior complex that we have, we tend to fail in it a lot as well. You look at Tom Shoes, for example. They said, "Oh, for every shoe you buy, we're going to give another pair to a kid in Africa." What that did was that shut down all of the people that had their own shoe stores in Africa. This savior complex almost always backfires. We're dropping food from the sky into these communities, and we're creating a bubble where if we no longer drop airdrop food to them, they're not going to be able to sustain themselves. It's going to collapse. So not only are we ignoring our people at home, we are not even remotely helping. We are destroying the communities abroad. We're now going to move to the lightning round of questions, and we've got a three-second one. What happened to the EMU in the start? Verse in the train, because where I'm from, emus don't win. That, that's the logical problem you had with that story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, five minutes left. Just a quick general question for both of you. Um, just wondering, how is it that the left get away with referring to us to Nazis when the freedom of speech, free market, have tenants that largely drive what we do? Well, so a Nazi is a shorthand for the most scary thing in existence. And for people who become dependent on the state, freedom is terrifying. We, we, we kind of look like a predator because we're bringing freedom. If you're not able to have honest arguments, like if you're dependent on the government for your income, and people come along and say, I think the free market should solve this, I think charity should solve this, I think that, that human kindness should, should solve this. That's really, really terrifying for people, you know. What Lauren was saying, we've created a, up to a, a third or even a half the population is dependent on the state for significant or all portions of their income. And they have adapted to that environment and so they just use words to describe us as the most terrifying thing because they now have become dependent to the point where freedom has become a predator and this is the great danger that we're all going to end up to blows over this stuff when freedom can solve it all. G'day. Um, first, thanks very much for all the content. Both of you, it's fantastic, and you put it out for free, so really appreciate it. I have a really long question about university preferable behaviour. I'll we'll skip it because we're running out of time. I'll put it on your forum. If you can answer it, that'd be awesome. So I'll do the quick one. Do you think culture is downstream from race? Either of you. I think it is a thesis well worth exploring. <laughs> questions of race and IQ is, is culture downstream of race? I'm not the expert, but the people who don't even want books like The Bell Curve to be published, the people who don't even want these questions to be explored, they're the issue. I love listening to podcasts on these things. I think we need to explore them. To censor them and ignore them is to shut down an entire area where we can find solutions to the problems of ethnic troubles, of cultural troubles. We can find solutions to this. This doesn't have to be a divisive thing. This doesn't have to be something that turns into a race war. It can entirely be something where we find solutions to problems within our culture. And in order to know if these ideas are wrong, we have to explore them in the first place. So I completely agree that these are all pieces worth exploring. Thank you. Hi, I'm 
Tracks here live show with the Unshackled, uh, we're alternative media in the universe. So my question, media, if you, it seems like it's going from consolidation, you can go back as far as the pyramids with hieroglyphics and writing, and, and to, to, to decentralization, and even with Bitcoin and stuff. Practical, philosophically, where do you think media is going? Wait, you're part of the old media, right? Absolutely. Well, stop asking and make it happen. <laughs> Wait, where's media going? Where do you want it to go? Oh, take yeah. it there. Yeah, yeah. That it's going towards decentralization, absolutely, and more silo because we see the mainstream media as a force that is collapsing. It's collapsing, it's, it's a power that is going down, and it, it's decentralization. Yeah, but remember, it's the most dangerous when it's going down, right? Just, yeah. just remember that. It's, it's not a battle anymore if we run to the media. All media is winning. Yeah. It absolutely is. Yeah. corporations and who's in power politically because they're going to be the ones that are going to try to shut us down but we are succeeding in the minds of the people and you will continue to I hope so good luck to your page everyone go check out I said we finish at 10.45 but we'll sneak in one final question apologies to everyone else in the oh, I'll let it be oh, I feel really bad <laughs> first of all you guys look and sound better in real life than on YouTube. Second of all, um, I just want to ask, what do you think is the best way to encourage the younger generation to think critically against the ideas espoused in the schooling and follow in this cult-like think and resignation? Because it's a lot of trouble from feminists and vegans and whatever. <laughs> I actually think that our enemies, the enemies of free speech and the enemies of open inquiry, have been the best argument and the best drawers of young people to our ideas. Gen Z is probably the most right-wing generation in the last while. They, oh, it's phenomenal. They are watching our YouTube videos, they are sharing it, and it's because they are going into their high school classrooms and they are having their teachers tell them every damn day, because you are a male, you are a privileged piece of crap. Because you're white, you should be ashamed of yourself. And because you're a female, you should be oppressed. And their life experiences are not lining up with these things that they are being told in class. So they're looking for alternative answers. They have YouTube. They spend way too much time on YouTube. And they're finding us. They're finding alternative media. And they're teachers that are just spreading these nonsensical ideas and telling them that they're not even, they're, they're not just terrible for being white, terrible for being male, male, privileged pieces of crap, but they're not allowed to have or propose alternative opinions. They are pushing the young people to all media. And if they continue doing this, if they continue their insane screaming and throwing of objects and period blood art, if they continue that, we'll be just fine. <laughs>